Yeah, Cassidy, it is um, it's an honor and a pleasure to to welcome you to Halftime Chats. Um, your show has been um, probably a catalyst of how my channel uh, has grown. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. But, you know, definitely we're looking forward to this next edition of Pastor Mike. But before we start, <laughs> we've got an international audience. So people that tune in from the Caribbean, from the Far East, Africa, and Europe. So they always would like to know where is Cassidy from and just where he was raised, just so they can get a sense of, of your origins as we move forward. Well, first of all, it's amazing to be here. I know you've been such a supporter of Pass the Mic from day one, and it's an honor to, to finally, uh, to finally uh, say hello to you in person, as opposed to simply on Instagram. <laughs> um, I was born and raised in New York City, okay. and I moved to Los Angeles about five years ago. Wow. And the home you see in Pass the Mic is yeah. my home in Los Angeles. Okay. It isn't a prop because, you know, we, we, um, I used to think it was the Beverly Hills Hotel because uh, you, you seem to... <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> flattered. I love, I love the Beverly Hills Hotel. If I could move to the Beverly Hills Hotel and film my show there, I would. But this is very much my living room. In fact, in fact the, um, um, the background of Pass the Mic is actually right over here. Okay. So if you watch Pass the Mic, you see this couch on the left side and then okay. there's another one on the other side my goodness we're growing up from new york and and i guess because i when i interviewed l um last a couple uh, last week I, I i was surprised that he was mixed race um i used to think he was puerto rican a lot of people have said you know just your complexion what is your sort of great heritage um i'm white i'm jewish my grandparents um. Um, came from various countries in Western Europe. Okay. Um, my grandparents um, escaped the Holocaust. They came wow. here at the end of World War II. And uh, they found themselves in New York City, where wow. they had my parents and my parents had me. And I spent <laughs> the majority of my life in New York City, never thought I would move. And, um, and as I mentioned, yeah, I moved to L.A. I followed the palm trees. <laughs> it sounds very similar to Jimmy Iovine. He said the same thing, leaving New York to the, to the California, not understanding the difference between the seasons and, and just sunshine continuously. Yeah, I saw him say that as well, I think, in <laughs> Defiant Ones. Defiant right? Ones, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, you know, I never thought I would leave New York. I was a diehard New Yorker, but I started to come to L.A. as the music business um, – um, as the music business moved to LA and, and, uh, I kind of never left. Yeah. Yeah. I, I lived briefly out in, uh, Redondo beach and loved, loved it there for, oh, three I love it there. Years. Yeah. Three I love it years. there. Redondo, Hermosa, Manhattan Hermosa. beach. Yeah. Yeah. You know, them. yeah. Yep. yeah I shark. ride bikes there all the time on the boardwalk. Oh goodness. Yes. Yeah, Sharkies, the, the, um, um, out in Hermosa. Yeah. We used to, yeah. Frequent there quite a bit. Um, you know, and I saw a sort of a documentary on your YouTube channel when it talks about your early inspiration where your parents bought you a turntable when you were 10 and, and stuff. But I was wondering how sort of soul music became something that you gravitated to. Um, was that stuff that your parents were listening to that you <clears throat> took an interest to or was it family and friends? It was actually none of the above. Okay. I, 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 I credit hip hop with exposing me to everything else. Yeah. I, I was a very close minded kid. I only wanted to listen to hip hop. And when my parents bought me turntables for my 10th birthday, I only wanted to play hip hop. But I idolized Grandmaster Flash, Cool Herc, and Africa Bambata. Wow. They were my superheroes. And in idolizing them, I researched them and I began to learn how they created hip hop. And I learned that they created hip hop by playing all kinds of music. And through playing R&B and, and soul funk disco and rock and roll and Caribbean music and 
they formed a new kind of music mm -hmm. by looking for the breakdowns yeah. in every song of all genres of music and by giving a microphone to an MC to hype the crowd over these breakdowns, they created hip hop. That was very fascinating to me as a child. It still is um, yeah. extremely fascinating to me as an adult, how that took shape. And that opened up my mind. It, it expanded who I wanted to be, not only as a music lover, but specifically as a DJ. So I credit hip hop entirely with my love affair of the R&B music of the 70s and 80s. And although that music wasn't the first music I fell in love with, yeah. and although it wasn't the first music I played as a DJ, it became, in many senses, what I was known for playing, particularly in the celebrity circles. Yeah, I mean, what made you different? Because I know, I heard when you spoke about how um, Diddy got your number, put it on a sort of kitchen towel and, and stuff, and you've, you've DJed from for President Obama, Oprah. I mean, it, it was almost mind-boggling. But I wonder what made you and what you did differently that, that others recognized and said, well, we need to get him on board. Well... <clears throat> It's always been difficult for me to try to articulate um, exactly why others have been drawn to me. I can only try to guess. <laughs> okay. um, and one uh, story that, that might pose an answer is the story when I met Puffy. I was 18 years old DJing at a club in New York, and it was a hot spot, but they kind of gave me like, the whack room in the basement <laughs> and it was also pouring rain that night so no one was in the club but at three in the morning i saw puffy come from the shadows and he danced as i remember by himself until five in the morning and i was playing um r b classics of the 70s and 80s funk soul disco so on and so forth so i was playing michael and Prince and Stevie and Earthlin and Shaka, so on and so forth. And Puffy finally was walking out around 5 a.m. and walked by the DJ booth and said, where's the DJ? <laughs> now, remember, when, when I was 18 years old, I looked like I was eight. <laughs> and I said, I'm the DJ. And he said, who's been here all night? playing all these classic records and I said me and he wrote down his number and said call me tomorrow and I was a freshman at NYU New York University and I was petrified to call him <laughs> and I finally had the confidence to call and it went straight to voicemail and it said God is the greatest beep <laughs> and <clears throat> I never left such an inarticulate voicemail in my life and I was certain he wouldn't call back, but I thought maybe I'd see him again. Anyway, I went to class and he called back and now he missed me again. And when I left class again, I ran home to my mother's house, still lived with my mom and locked myself in a room. And I said, he called back and I called him back and, and they put him right on the phone. And he said, playboy, he said, uh, he said, how do you know how to play those records like that? And I said, like what? And he goes, like you lived it. Wow. And I'll never forget that. Um, so I don't know. That's the best way I can explain it. I don't, I don't know. I don't know why or how I played those records that night in a way that impressed him. But I went on to DJ parties for him and continue to do to this day, to put it in perspective, that year, or should I say a few months after I met him, I DJed Puffy's 32nd birthday, and two years ago, I DJed his 50th birthday. Wow. And I went on shortly thereafter that to DJ for Jennifer Lopez and Naomi Campbell and Jay-Z and Beyonce, and then, of course, Oprah and Obama. <laughs> and I do think there was a commonality 
in all these relationships. And although I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, I think all of these people I mentioned were drawn to me, uh, perhaps for many ways, but for one way in particular that was common amongst everyone, I think they were drawn to me by how I played the R&B music of the 70s and 80s. So that mm -hmm. could encompass anything under the R&B category, soul, funk, disco, so on and so forth. And I don't know how or why I, I became that person or how or why I played that music in such a way that was attractive to people whom I admire. But I certainly fell in love with that music yeah. and it came from hip hop. I do believe that that era of R&B music is the greatest dance music ever created. I've said that many times before. The R&B music of the late 1970s, early 1980s is the greatest dance music of all time. I believe it is the greatest party music of all time. Those records exude a spirit and a soul and an energy on the dance floor like no other. Mm. It really was the last era of dance music that was played by live musicians. Oh, okay, yeah. And I think that has a very big um, part to do with that. I think that I think that nothing moves the human body more than the human hand. Yeah. And when it's live musicians playing the dance music, it does create something special. And that era of music really is the sound of celebration. Mm. And I've always wanted to project that. I've always wanted to exude celebration. I believe when you come to a DJ Cassidy party, you are experiencing the sound of celebration and the spirit of celebration. Wow. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. And, and, and a lot of us have noticed the difference between sort of the way music is produced now electronically and as opposed to using real session musicians in the studio, creating sound and, and stuff. And that's why when we do go to a live concert, there's a very different feel to being with a concert with a band playing as opposed to when we're just listening to it on a record. When you look through all, all of this, you must have had really supportive family who said, wow, you know, you're going into this music stuff, you know, especially they got you the turntables. Um, or did you, I mean, how was that trying to navigate playing hip hop in a time when hip hop was almost regarded as, a, you know, this is street music? <laughs> There was certainly a danger surrounding hip hop um, in the early '90s. There, there was kind of a kind of an air of danger when people thought of concerts and mm. when people thought of the parties and um, even when people thought of the music. Um, I don't think when my parents bought me turntables and a mixer for my 10th birthday that any of us had any idea that, that DJing would become my career and the foundation of my identity. Wow. I credit my parents tremendously for buying me an unconventional gift <laughs> for allowing loud music <laughs> at all hours of the night wow. for allowing me to have CDs and records with the parental advisory <laughs> sticker on the cover. <laughs> and I credit my father for taking me to hip hop concerts when a lot of parents were scared to, wow. um, you know, Parents might take their kids to a concert or a sports game or yeah. something they want to go to, but I only wanted to go to hip hop concerts. That's all I ever asked to go to. I was never a sports fan, never cared about going to the Knicks game or the Yankees <laughs> game or the Giants game, never cared about going to pop concerts. I really just wanted to go to hip hop shows. Wow. And so I have a lot to thank my parents for the, 
the exposure to the concerts when I wanted to go, um, the explicit music, um, <laughs> the loud music, and of course the turntables and mixer. Without all that, I don't know yeah. if I would be DJ Cassidy. I think the biggest lesson I learned, I'm not a parent, but maybe one day in the future I will be, is to simply encourage your child's passion because you never know what it will become. Yeah. You know, I, I still worked hard in high school. I still went to college while I was DJing for Puffy and for Jennifer and for Jay and Beyonce. All that started when I was in college. And there were moments in college where I still thought I would graduate and get a job at a record label or something oh. like that. <laughs> okay. But once I graduated, it was crystal clear that I was a DJ and that was my profession. And I was already steps ahead of most kids graduating high school and college who had not yet found a calling. Yeah. And what a blessing it is to find a calling that you love, to be able to make a dollar doing something you love yeah. is a privilege that yeah. most people don't ever enjoy. And so every time I earn a dollar <laughs> playing records and making people dance, I'm extremely grateful. I'd be grateful for those opportunities if I didn't make a dollar. Yeah. But when I'm able to support myself and to call it a profession, it's even more of a blessing. Yeah. You know, what is it? What, how did you stay focused to graduate from college? Because if you were doing... <clears throat> among celebrities making some good money a lot of people would just say well what's the point of finishing college there were moments where i said what's the point of finishing college <laughs> okay, okay there were definitely moments writing term papers at four <laughs> in the morning um, i mean i remember sometimes djing the night before final exam literally bringing the book to the club you know because back in those days i wasn't a headlining dj i I played the club from 10 p.m. to 4 in the morning. So from 10 p.m. to 12 a.m., there was a lot of downtime. I might have a book open over the mixer. Wow. And that was a real thing. What kept me going, I really couldn't begin to tell you. I think I had a certain sense of pride. Like, I want to be able to, to say I did it. I wanted to be able to say I did it. And it does give me a little sense of pride that I did it. Yeah. Um, could I have left and accomplished everything I accomplished as a DJ? Quite possibly so, I'll never know. But I was a sociology major, of all things. And <laughs> sociology is really the study of people and study of human interactions and wow. the study of how people move across the globe. And, okay, yeah. um, and uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps some of that helped me. Yeah. In my ability to read a crowd, you know, DJing is a lot of people watching, mm. right? Whether you're starting off the night at 10 p.m. or whether you're on stage in front of thousands of people or doing a little exclusive party in L.A. or New York, no matter what it is, you always have moments where you are people watching, studying what makes people tick, what makes people move. Yeah. Um, I do believe DJing is is all about emotion. It's about creating emotion. Songs make you feel aggressive, sexy, romantic, laid mm. back, energetic, violent. Songs create emotions. And so DJs take you on this emotional journey. So perhaps my sociological studies <laughs> influenced <laughs> my DJing abilities in some way. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're, you're totally right about that. And, and, <laughs> Because there is a very difference when you have a DJ who's just playing the hits because you have got this exclusive hit or somebody who's, who brings a sound that you've not heard, but you feel as if you've known it before um, in, in England, because I, I was born in England, but went to high, um, college, high school in, in Nigeria. We, they used to call it Ray Groove. So it's, 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 it is like the, the, the uh, late 70s, mid 80s, where it's a jam that... Ray rare, you don't, you know, mix it with some some of the, some Caribbean soul, but it's stuff that you it wouldn't be popular, and so you just really vibe to it and stuff. And a DJ would see, okay, people are moving there, and then they bring in something else, and then they get something popular and stuff. 
finding the music, that must be the hardest part, not just playing all the, the big hits, but playing stuff that people don't know but appreciate. How hard was that? Well, as a young kid, discovering new music was the most exciting experience because so much of what I heard was new. Mm -hmm. I would be in a clothing store and hear a record. I would be at a nightclub and hear a hundred records I didn't know. <laughs> I'd be at, you know, an industry party and hear another hundred records I didn't know. I'd be watching TV and hear a song in a commercial. You know, when you're young and you know so little, <laughs> everything feels new. And I absorbed everything. You know, um, a lot of my early research was me going to clubs in my late teens, early 20s, listening to other DJs. I would come home late at night. My mom would have an eye open, scream my name, Cass, is that you? Are you home? And she would say, where were you? And I would name three clubs. And she would say, who did you go with? And I would say, alone. You know, I would go out to these clubs alone to study. And this was really before smartphones. So, yeah. you know, I might've had a cell phone, but you couldn't really type on it. I would literally bring a little, a little notebook and a pen to write down song titles. Or if I didn't know a song title, I would listen for the chorus and write down a lyric and then go home and have to figure out what that song was. Wow. Some of this was even before the internet, although most of it I had the internet and you could Google it, but this was even before Googling was, think, you know, yeah. something we did a hundred times a day. So really I'd wake up the next morning and call people. I'd call an older person than myself and say, what's this song? And I would start singing the line or reading the <laughs> lyric that I wrote down. Sometimes I would be in a club and I would go to a payphone if I didn't have a cell phone at that point and sing the chorus that I had just heard into my home answering machine. Wow. So that the next day I would have a record of the songs I wanted to learn. Now, of course, you Shazam it. You know, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, it's easier now. It's yeah. still a fun process, but that, you know, those experiences, you can never, you can never relive those, you know, your, your first experiences are always the most exciting. They will yeah. never be topped. Yeah. Puffy seeing me at a club and giving me his number and telling me to call him. <laughs> it doesn't matter how exciting a party is. He could throw the greatest party on earth. It will never be that moment. You know, yeah. being discovered is a moment, no matter how exciting past the mic gets, it yeah. will never feel like the night volume one air. Yeah. It will never feel like that again. And that's yeah. a good thing. That's a beautiful thing. The night that passed the mic volume one aired, I went to sleep feeling like I had stumbled upon something so special. And I was so nervous because I didn't know what to do with volume one. I sat on it for a minute. I didn't know where to air it. I thought no one would watch and I didn't know what to do with it. And then that night I went to bed feeling like, wow, this was discovered and people, people reacted. So the firsts are always the most exciting. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, we, 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 I mean, you, you brought up volume one and, and um, during the, and, uh, I do want to go back to your record career, um, uh, but before we do that, but you brought up volume one and, you know, globally we were all shut down. You know, people didn't know what to do. I mean, I started doing this because I'm I'm a therapist, so I'm a uh, you know I, I work oh, really? with under twenty ones. I work with kids from five to under twenty ones, and so to me, I was doing this just to get just to hear an inspirational story so I can share with my with the kids I'm working with. But for you, what was I? Uh, you know, I've heard the story about you know what was your inspiration to think you not know, let me call my old my friends and contacts to. to to, to record something that hadn't been done. So there was no blueprint. <clears throat> well, I can tell you exactly how it happened. It was April, 2020. And I was sitting on my couch right over there, which you don't see in the show. That's where the <laughs> camera is. And I was FaceTiming with my friend and mentor, Verdine White of Earth, Wind and Fire. Wow. And Verdine was sitting on his couch and we were both wearing fancy pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> and while I'm FaceTiming with my legendary friend, his legendary song, That's the Way of the World, comes on my speakers in the background very low. And Verdine hears it and starts to sing along like, oh, it's my song. Hearts <laughs> of fire, create love, desire. 
And I got such chills down my spine. First of all, that song gives me chills mm -hmm. in and of itself. But now I'm sitting here with the world in flux. And I'm FaceTiming with one of my heroes, really like a founding member of the greatest R&B band of all time. Oh, yeah. And he's just singing along to his song. And I said, how beautiful is this moment and how privileged am I to have relationships with so many of my musical heroes and how privileged am I to experience moments like this? And then I said to myself, maybe there's a way for me to recreate this feeling for others and give this feeling that I have right now to other people around the world, particularly at such a crazy time. Yeah. And I immediately had the idea. I immediately thought of pass the mic. I thought of the phrase pass the mic and I envisioned it. I envisioned me sitting right over there. Wow. Um, with the fireplace behind me, which is right over there. Yeah. And I envisioned me dropping iconic records, but bringing on the artists who sing those songs to sing along. And I envisioned it right away how you see it. I envisioned the pace being rapid fire. Yeah. No one would ever sing a second verse. All the viewers would want more. No one would ever want less. Wow. It would be the greatest sing-along jam session ever. And it would be technologically innovative and groundbreaking. And it would present these iconic songs in a way like never before, in a more intimate way than never before, in a more personal way than ever before. And in a way that allows for modern day um, attention spans. Mm, yeah. As we know, with modern technology and social media, people have no attention spans. Now, <laughs> DJs have always been conducive to low attention spans because <laughs> we've always loved playing records fast. Yeah. And, you know, Kid Capri was always known most for that. Rapid fire songs. Drop mm. a record, drop a record, drop a record. Kid Capri was and is the king of that. And I didn't quite think of it as deliberately as I'm articulating it now, but what developed was a presentation of iconic records in a very modern way. And I didn't think about that all on the phone call with Nadine, <laughs> but, I, but, but, but I saw what it would be on that phone wow. call. And I hung up with him. I said, I gotta call you back. I have an idea. I love you. I'll call you tomorrow. And I called an editor that I work with frequently. Ian Park. He's a brilliant editor and he's edited many of my music videos and reels over the years. And I told him about this idea and I said, we got to figure out a way to do this. This show was never a Zoom show. Everyone thought, oh, you just record the Zoom. <laughs> yeah. and, and how is everything in sync? Yeah. <laughs> It was never that simple and I've never explained it publicly and I might never explain it publicly, but it was, um, it was never that simple. It became simpler when I started to make it for television, but the first oh. three episodes were not quite so simple. And I had to think of how to explain this to artists so that they could do this on their own with me, of course, but with no one else. And I had to not only explain it to artists who might not be technologically savvy, because mm. many of us are not, but I had to explain it to a lot of older artists who didn't mm. grow up with laptops and iPhones. And that was the real, um, you know, that was the first hurdle to cross. Once we crossed that, I now had to convince 20 or so icons to take a leap of faith on a crazy idea. There was no prototype. Yeah. I had to call back Verdeen. Then I had to call <laughs> Philip Bailey and Ray Parker Jr. and Denise Williams and Saida Garrett and Howard Hewitt and Bobby Brown and Ricky Bell and Steve Arrington and Cool from Cool in the Gang and, and Khalees from Cool in the Gang, who has since passed. And that was the last thing he ever did, which is a whole other conversation. And, and I had to convince these people to trust me. And the only way I could explain why they trusted me is that I only called people whom I already knew because uh, okay. I knew it would, I knew it would require trust. Yeah. So, so I called my most legendary friends and somehow, some way 
they obliged. Yeah, you know, um, as much as I'm a big fan of Pastor Mike Three because of, of the the '90s acts, um, the 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 vibe of, of, of the first one is 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 probably because uh-huh. some of them were playing live. It just felt soothing. It just felt like because you know I don't know if you ever watched the Real World back on MTV and the one mm-hmm. they did in New York. No one knew what to expect. And then I think LA was the same, but later on everyone knew what to expect. So it felt more staged, but the first two are the ones where they didn't know what to look at. And so that's how it felt like, okay, we're just doing it and, and we're having fun. Um, the idea of wearing the, the silk pajamas, was that something that you, <laughs> that, you, that you look back on and think, yeah, maybe I should have not ordered it. <laughs> First of all, I love you for asking that question. I know you've really been a fan of the show, and it's <laughs> it's great when you have the opportunity to do an interview with someone who's a real fan of the show, not someone who, um, you know, who the producer said you're interviewing DJ Cassidy today, because you always get really smart questions. I've never been asked this. So, oh. firstly, the pajamas were inspired by the FaceTime call with Verdine. Yeah, he He and I were wearing these kind of fancy pajamas or, you know, kind of fancy loungewear. (laughs) And it was secondly inspired by the pandemic. Everyone was kind of locked indoors. And so I wanted this to be like, I wanted this to be like a stamp in time, Mm. you know, where you could really feel the moment. Yeah. And, you know, girls were posting, when was the last time I wore my heels? You know, like <laughs> no one was wearing real clothes. Yeah, yeah. I hadn't put on my boater hat in a while. So I liked the idea that I got from the FaceTime of representing the pandemic. Yeah. And and then, of course, I just thought, what better way to be DJ Cassidy Fly than black silk pajamas? <laughs> Um, one of my best friends, O'Neill McKnight, oh, that's, who's a um, Renaissance man, recording artist, is it, and Andre's TV nephew? producer, Andre Harrell's cousin, correct? Cousin, yeah. Um, I had sent O'Neill the first few clips, and he called me back and he goes, "This is amazing." He goes, "You need to redo your parts though and change your clothes. You can't wear black <laughs> silk pajamas." <laughs> And I stood my ground. You know, O'Neill is always the source of inspiration to me. He's been a huge source of inspiration when it comes to fashion. But I had to hold my ground. I felt like it was just, you know, a great representation of the time. Yeah. Also, one other thing I'm not sure you noticed, I didn't wear sunglasses. I was going to say first. that. I was going to say that. Yeah, you didn't wear the glasses. And yeah, you looked different. I could, t- <laughs> I could tell you. I could tell you why. I... In the same spirit of the pajamas, I, I, I really wanted to relay a feeling that was personal and intimate. And wearing my signature shades didn't feel like I was home in my living room. You know, wearing my boater hat barely felt like I was home in my <laughs> living room. So I said, all right, I'll wear that signature, but maybe I'll lose the glasses I also wanted to connect with the artists as personally as possible. And I thought if I could look into their eyes, it would feel personal. Yeah. I don't regret the pajamas. I love it. It's, it's really um, yeah. a time capsule. Yeah. It was still me. It was still fly. Yeah. I don't regret not wearing sunglasses. I wanted to people to really feel my sincerity and my emotion. Yeah. But then on volume three, I was like, all right, it's showtime again. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, this is popping <laughs> off. Yeah. All right, I got to go into full DJ Cassidy mode. I got a blazer custom made for that one. The first two, I just pulled out what was in the closet. And, you know, the rest is history. I realized it was time to, to bring the stage to the living room at that point. Yeah. No, but with volume one, I think it's, it was perfect. I think the pajamas worked. I think everything and the setting, I mean, Ray Paula Jr., you know, with his cigar. And it just, it just felt relaxed. And I think that's the, and I would hope it will, it will get back to that sort of state, that sort of feel, because I, I know you're doing stuff with BET and, and, and then it's bigger production and stuff. But that's why those first ones just felt like everyone was just in there. And it's a different time I also have to remember. People are no longer stuck at home. So the, the vibes changed. But that's probably why we endured loved those first ones because 
it just felt like it just felt real didn't feel as staged even though it's pre-recorded and stuff there's nothing like a first yeah there's nothing like a first you know i think we talked about that earlier there's there's nothing like a first you know no matter how great nas continues to be yeah you can never recapture illmatic that was written in his mother's apartment, I believe, where he grew up in Queensbridge. You can't recreate that energy. You can't recreate the beginning of a pandemic, um, you know, when neither uh, the artist nor I had any idea what we were doing. I watched those early episodes and I almost cringe sometimes because, wow. um, but, but, you know, in a fun way, but, okay, you know, I left so many holes between 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 lines of records. I would never leave those holes now. Now the ad libs are perfectly executed. Okay. I think of everything before. You know, it's all freestyled in the end, but I have a game plan in my mind. Those first few episodes, there was zero plan. <laughs> there was zero script. There were zero redos. It was really as organic and freestyled as it could get. The only real work that went into it was the editing yeah but the actual segments were so organic wow um and look when i watch volume one now yeah i'm being very real i don't think and i don't watch it often okay. i i don't think i've watched any of these episodes in their entirety in months and months and months I've watched clips because I have a sizzle reel that shows them all, but I haven't watched full episodes in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I have a plan about that. I'm actually going to, I'm going to tell you, actually, I think you're going to be the first person I tell, but I, if I watch volume one, I will cry period. Wow. I will cry watching it. It, it just brings me, I don't even want to put the focus on the pandemic. We all have our own pandemic memories, some good, yeah. some, you know, some bad. It's not even about the pandemic. It just brings me back to this time almost two years ago of just having an idea and creating something and receiving the faith and trust of people whom I revere. And when those first piano licks come in on That's the Way of the World, mm -hmm. that first... 60 seconds i get chills i wow. really get chills and i will forever be indebted to verdine and philip for what they did yeah um you know they've been there for me now you know more than a handful of times in my career they've played on records of mine they've come to events of mine you know i'm really not worthy of the support they've given me but you know, I guess now it's not support, it's friendship. You know, we've yeah. really become friends. But for Verdine and Philip to take a leap of faith and do my silly idea, you know, of which we had no idea what would become of it, was really an incredible thing, which, you know, I will never forget. Yeah, because you, but you, what you did is you exposed them to a generation who had lost touch with the 70s and 80s. And and probably didn't, you know, weren't exposed much because with BET, we're not getting the videos and we're not seeing them. And so that's what you, you were able to do. A whole generation, wow, I didn't realize about this song. Oh, I didn't realize this person did that. And that's the, 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 one of the legacies I can see from what that is, from, from Pastor Mike, because it did get generations of people who didn't know fall in love with a, a genre of music that's, only a select people were still able to, to access and, and, and enjoy. And at the same time, I'm going to flip this on you. <laughs> I think it exposed older people who yeah. were a fan, say, of Volume 1 and the Soul Train edition to hip-hop. You know, the Pass the Mic show that aired after the BET Awards in June was a show celebrating the greatest hip hop and R&B and reggae records, of which there were several, of the 2000s. Yeah. That show spanned from 2000 to 2009. Those are very recent records. And those artists are still very young. <laughs> and 
I think in the same way that I exposed teenagers and 20 year olds to the great R&B songs of the 70s and 80s, I think we probably also exposed people who grew up with those records yeah. to hip hop and R&B records of the 2000s and made them realize, oh, wait, I know the words to all of these songs as well. Yeah. What it really has done is reminded us. And when I say us, I mean music lovers of all ages. It's reminded us of what our favorite songs are. Yeah. Because all of these songs I like to think of as the greatest songs of all time. Yeah. I really, I make that statement often. I go, these are the greatest songs <laughs> of all time. Yeah. Um, they are. Mm. They are the greatest songs of all time. And they've touched my life. That's yeah. why I include the songs I include. I choose the songs based on the songs that hold the most special place in my heart. Yeah. Because the songs to me, they have to be the, the interaction between me and the record and me and the artist has to be authentic. I never want to have to study the lyrics or yeah. figure out where to ad lib an MC. Yeah. I have to have been doing it for years. It has to be in me already. Yeah. No rehearsal needed. So these are the greatest songs of all time. I think it's reminded us. Uh, I think it's reminded us what the greatest songs of all time are. It's reminded us what our favorite songs of all time are. And it's reminded younger people, oh, wait, I know the words to every one of these songs. <laughs> and it's reminded older viewers, wait, I know the words to this Ja Rule and Nelly song also. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's bridged a lot of gaps. It's built a lot of bridges between people, ages, races, localities. I think it's bridged gaps between genres and eras. Yeah. I've always wanted to be the DJ that was unbound by genre and unbound by era. Yeah. And I'm really proud that I get to exhibit that on this show because that's really the foundation of the show. There, there are no boundaries and we all sing together. Yeah. And we all dance together and we all party together and we all celebrate together. If you take home anything from this show, that's what I would love people to take home. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I think it nothing uh, is used that more when you did volume two with the hip hop because you brought in artists that a lot of us like, oh, man, um, oh, name, you know, Rakim. Although I didn't really recognize him because you see he, self, he was so far back in his throne. Um, black uh, sheep and, and um, you know. Eric Sermon, Eric Sermon. Eric Sermon. Schnickens, MC yeah. Search, MC Light, Arrested Development. They, you had LL Cool J rapping as if he, was, he needed to rap as fast as he could, hard as he could <laughs> to earn his meat. I mean, it, it almost, you know, um, it, 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 you know it, and, and that's actually the one that most of my generation from Nigeria were like, look at all the MC stuff. So they pushed past that. And I saw two, then saw one. And, and oh, now, you saw volume two first. Um, yeah, I saw volume two first because a lot of my friends um, who, 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 who grew up in Nigeria were really big into hip hop. And, those, and so they really circulated that. And I was like, wow, this is volume two. Let's see what one was. And then after I saw one, I think the, the next week, Volume three was coming out, so I th was waiting overnight <laughs> for volume three. Now, I'm, my inspiration for music has always been Teddy Riley. So I've loved the sort of the eight, 90s and, and late 80s and 90s. And so when you did volume three, I just felt like, okay, I can rest now because this is it. These are all these records I bought. And these were, you know, it was just, it was, it, to me, it was, it was the most, personal one for me because and I think it was the one I really blew up I don't know if from your point of view is that the one that you thought sort of took it well well I think it was all a trajectory it, but yeah but I knew I knew what two and three were going to be after one I didn't know I was ever going to do a two until oh. one premiered yeah there was no, there was no future this was a one-off but I immediately, immediately felt overwhelmed by the reaction to one. Wow. You know, 10,000 people watched one live and I went to bed so happy. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe 10,000 people 
had come into this little thing I promoted with no help during a time when so many people were streaming things and there was so much to watch in addition to, of course, regular TV and Netflix. <laughs> yeah. The second I saw the reaction, the night of volume one, I could have, I could have wrote down exactly what two and three would be song by song. Wow. I knew exactly what it would be. I knew those two eras. I knew who I was calling first. I knew how I would sequence it. Everything after developed, but two and three, I knew exactly what, how, and why. You know, those were really the records I grew up on, you know, yeah. on two and three. That's really me as a, as a seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old. <laughs> and, you know, they say the music you listen to as a child, you know, yeah. is the music that you hold most dear to your heart. The music you listen to, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade yeah. in high school, you know, that's those two episodes yeah. for me. And, uh, you know, people often ask me, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you were going, were you going to ask me what my favorite episode was or were you going to refrain from that kind of question? You know what? And uh, the reason why it's important to know that because I can, someone that can ask me who's my favorite guest and I, and I know it's hard to, to pick, but from, and, it's, and it, you know, everyone would say, yes, you, you, it, Elf said it's like picking his children when I ask him what his favorite song is, but he had to give me a song. But out of all, you know, you're going to your ninth one now. You know, you've done eight. Well, we haven't seen nine yet, but what is, <laughs> which one was it? What song did Elder Bards tell you? Uh, Stay With Me. I hate answering this, but I'm going to. <laughs> Needless to say, and I know this is going to sound like boilerplate disclaimers, they all hold a tremendous place in my heart. And they really all make me emotional. Mm. Talking about volume one a few seconds ago, I didn't tear, but I actually got a little mm. feeling in my heart. It makes me emotional talking about volume one. There is one episode that's just like, <laughs> it's just my everything. Um, that's volume two. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, you know, hip hop's my first love. You, yeah, you did say that. It doesn't matter what I fell in love with after. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. Your first love holds a unique place in your heart that can never be changed. Yeah. So everything else after doesn't affect that. It affects everything else, but it doesn't affect your first love. Yeah. Um, hip hop is my first love. It's why I became a DJ. Wow. And if I had to say, gun to my head, <laughs> what artist affected you the most? Those artists on volume two made me who I am. Mm. Hip hop is why I became a DJ. Hip hop. Is, is why I thought like I thought. Hip hop is why I dressed like I dressed. You know, I could explain to you why this cricket sweater is hip hop, why this <laughs> hat is hip hop. <laughs> I could explain to you why my jewelry is hip hop. You might not see it at first glance. It might not look like what you think is hip hop. It, it's all hip hop and it all comes from hip hop. And my infatuation with every other artist on Past the Mic comes from hip hop. Mm. Having Run DMC and LL Cool J set that off, <laughs> after having Earth, Wind, and Fire set off Volume One, I mean, yeah, yeah, you could kind of just die a happy person. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you are right, especially when you think about LL. You know, um, he, he did a little post of him staring at the wall, and I remember, I need love. I mean, as a kid, and I, and I, I went to. I was born in England, but I went to high school in Nigeria. So when he came out with I Need Love and I'm Bad, and when Run DMC went out, the, their music crossed from New York <laughs> to parts of Africa like Nigeria. <clears throat> and for us, it was like, wow, this is interesting, unique. So to have the legendary GOAT uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the founding fathers of Run DMC, it was like, wow, this is, 
unique because we not we, you know we don't, they're not performing like that uh, you know as a duo together. But you had them, Graham Puba, uh, you had Rakim, Big Daddy Kane, um, to, um, um, uh, Young MC, Young MC. Yeah, I mean, you know, Chub Rock. Yeah, I love Chub Rock in Nigeria. You know, he you know he's sort of almost like he's debating when he's speaking and stuff like that. And, and those of us who love Heavy D would have thought if he was still around, I'm sure I would hope he would have made the, the made an addition. Um, but it heavy John... heavy was a friend of mine. Wow. Whom I knew through O'Neill McKnight and Andre Harrell and Steve okay. Rifkin, who's my partner on Pass the Mike and executive producer. And Heavy would surely have been on the show. Wow. You know, I have a few regrets, you know, um, the fat boys should have been on the show before Prince Marky D passed. Houdini should have been on the show. Wow. The, um, I wanted Biz Marky to be on that show, but he was already, um, he was already not well at that time. Mm. But, you know, you can't look back. You can only look forward. Yeah. Um, hopefully there'll be other ways to tribute those artists that we've lost um, through the past year and a half to two years. But yeah, that show holds a very unique place in my heart. You know, when I called LL, he said to me, what song would you want me to do? <laughs> and I, I said, radio. And he couldn't believe that I said radio. <laughs> you know, he was so expecting me to say, mama said, knock you out or around the way girl, yeah. or even rock the bells. Mm. I think those were the three, he never expected radio. And he said, why? He asked me why. So here's what I told him. I said, I'm celebrating what many people call the golden era of hip hop. And for those who don't use that word, many simply refer to it as the greatest era, like the founding era, the era when hip hop came into its own. People have, you know, all their own ways of describing it, but it's a very special era. Yeah. of not only hip hop, of music that changed the world. Yeah. And it was really the era I grew up on, this era of like 83 to 93. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to tell a story and I wanted the story to be told in a loose chronological mm. manner. And I told him that I'm setting off the show with Sucker MCs. And I said the next piece of that puzzle in my mind, as a fan. Now, yeah. I didn't live it like LL. I didn't live <laughs> it like Russell. I'm grateful to call them all, um, um, I'm grateful to call them all my friends, but I didn't live it. But from my perspective as a fan, the next piece of the puzzle after Sucker MCs has to be LL. It's what, it's how hip hop progressed yeah, yeah. and grew. Um, musically, commercially. And I said, I want you to tell that story. And Mama Said Knock You Out doesn't tell that story. Mm. Uh, um, radio tells that story. And I also want to do things that are unexpected on Pass the Mic. I don't want Run DMC to do Walk This Way <laughs> or It's Tricky. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when I called DMC, he thought I was going to want Walk This Way or Tricky. And I explained the same thing to him. I said, this isn't about the biggest pop song or the yeah. most commercially successful. It's about iconic moments yeah. that bring you back to a place and tell a story. Yeah. And I was a little kid watching Crush Groove. <laughs> and I was infatuated by the story of Def Jam. Obviously, mm. Crush Groove yeah. is a synonym for Def Jam. It's the Hollywood version. Uh. And I, I was infatuated by the story of Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin and Run DMC and the Beastie Boys and LL Cool J. And the scene in Crush Groove in which LL walks into the room with Run DMC and Andre Harrell um, is an iconic scene. Mm -hmm. Um. And I wanted almost to recreate that. He walks in and does that verse. He walks in and goes, my radio, believe me, I like it loud. I'm the man with the box that can rock the crowd. 
And when he came on the computer with me to do this, and I explained to him what to push yeah. and what to press, and I saw that he was wearing this Rock the Bells jacket that wasn't out yet and sunglasses, and he came prepared to remind people why he's referred to as the GOAT. Yeah. He really came prepared, and I was really honored and still am talking about it i get chills i was really honored that he took it so seriously and that's what people saw yeah and when you watch that he he was the first person including me i hadn't come into my past the mic own yet he was the first to go in and go out (laughs) and he held the boom box and but he's an actor you can't forget he's an actor and so he knows how to work even a shitty um, you know, laptop, um, you know, low resolution camera. Yeah. He worked it and he went in and out and back and, uh, and he worked it like no one had worked it, including myself. He changed the game on how, how wow. people I think work the camera on the show. Yeah. Um, but look, I have, you know, moments like that for everyone. Every artist has given me a <laughs> moment and a story. Yeah, I interviewed Fire MC and, and I asked him, well, how come he didn't do treat him and, and stuff? And he said, no, that you you said, nope, we don't need your biggest hit, but uh, there's a particular, you know, wanted to honor Andre because I think Andre had just passed by the time you did it. And, you know, and, but I've spoken to all the people from Donnell to the guys from uh, Mike and Slim from 112 and Lily from SWV. And, and I always say, and even uh, your, your good friend, uh, Bo Legge Lou, and they all talk about how much you exude the passion that is not just an act. And I think El DeBarge summed it properly that that you, this is that you are naturally just you just love people, love music, and just love spreading joy. And and I think some of us might think, well, he's just a little too happy. But then that's you. And and I think we've come to really appreciate appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. It, <laughs> it, it really makes me emotional to hear that that you've spoken to all these artists about me. I, I knew you had spoken to to a few about me. I've seen a few clips, but I have not seen the full episodes of all the shows you just mentioned. And I have to go back now and watch them. In fact, on a side note, I would love those clips because I would love to incorporate them into the real. Um, I... I get really emotional when I hear about artists talking about the show, particularly when I'm not around. You know, people say nice things about you when you're around, Mm. but it's what people say when you're not listening that really hits home. And to know that you've even brought up my name to these artists is something that feels very surreal to me. And to know that they talked about me with you in a positive light and had fond memories of me and the show is the greatest gift the show could ever give me. I know that's not the same gift the show gives everyone else, but from a personal perspective, hearing artists talk about this show when I'm not around is the greatest gift I could ever receive. Because then I really know I did something right. If you impress your heroes, that's the greatest gift ever. Yeah. To impress your heroes, that's something you can only dream about as a kid. Yeah. So when you tell me Elder Barge talked about me, really? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, SWV talked about me? Yeah. You know, Father MC, you know, was a pivotal artist in the Andre Harrell Uptown Records history and remains a very, very important person carrying on the legacy of Uptown. His partner in crime, Jimmy Love, mm. was Andre Harrell's right-hand man and father and Jimmy um, um, are still very close and work together and do a lot of projects together. And um, I know father through the Andre Harrell, Jimmy Love, O'Neill McKnight circle. Mm. And it was very important for me to have him on that show that was a celebration Um, in many ways of the New Jack Swing era, the Uptown Records era, the Teddy Riley era. 
Yeah. The Andre Harrell era okay. and Andre yeah. had just passed. And, oh, yeah. you know, one reason I did want to do the song we did was because there was a line that mentioned Andre Harrell. Yeah. And it was very important to me. But, you know, these shows are a puzzle. Putting together songs seamlessly in a 30 minute show is a puzzle. Now, you got to remember prior to BET, I had no time restraints whatsoever. Mm. So the shows could be however long I wanted. Now that I do them for BET, yeah. the shows are 30 minutes, but commercials take up 10 minutes. So when I deliver a show to BET, the show has to be 19 minutes, 45 seconds, and not one frame longer or shorter. Wow. So imagine putting together a DJ mix, but it needing to be exactly a certain amount of time. So putting together songs is a musical puzzle. It's a technical puzzle. So that also has an effect on, on what songs I choose and where songs go. Yeah. Obviously, creative is the number one, but there's also technical elements that affect those decisions. I mean, now that you've done all this stuff with BT and, and, and you, you've got all the, the big, you know, Jesse and all these people involved, does it feel more, um, you know, when you did it by yourself, did it seem like it was more work then? Or does it feel like it's more, more work and pressure now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's more work for television because there are guidelines and there are parameters and there are delivery specs <laughs> and you also have to deliver it a certain time in advance. So you have deadlines. The first three volumes, I think I was making changes the night before. <laughs> um, so it's definitely more work for television, but any way you slice it, all nine episodes have been a complete labor of love and have locked me in the house. I mean, when I begin, I don't leave the house for at least a month. Wow. You know, I don't think I leave the house to go to lunch or go to dinner. I literally go outside to the backyard just to get some sun on my face for five minutes, but I really don't leave the house. Wow. Cause I, cause it, that's probably explains since when we, if those of us who follow you on your social media would see you at one point, going all the places but then now there seems to be a quiet there seems to be a complete lockdown <laughs> and stuff like that it, and i guess it's what you're saying yeah you're busy working yeah and getting, getting. i i don't do i don't do many interesting things while i'm shooting past the mic other than shooting past the mic <laughs> we, we, you know I, I, and i'm going to talk about a feature once but you you this uh coming weekend you've got the reggae one it has been strange because a lot of people you know, and I said, I've got an international audience. Oh, when is he going to do a reggae or dance hall and stuff? And he did surprise us that you're doing a complete one. Um, how did that sort of idea um, come to mind that you thought, okay, you know what? I know that internationally reggae and dance hall is big, maybe not as big in the US, um, but I'm <laughs> going to go with, with a leap of faith here. Well, I've always envisioned the reggae episode from the very beginning. I told you that volume two and three, I knew right away. Yeah. But I also had ideas for all other themes, categories, eras. I knew very early on. I don't know if it was before two and three or right after, but I knew very early on, certainly by the time three was done, that I wanted to do a reggae edition. Wow. I don't look at reggae as global music or international music. I think it's as important um, and as uh, relevant and significant in the US as any other kind um, of music that has affected my life. Yeah. You know, again, there is something very personal about this show. So <laughs> all the artists and songs have affected me personally. Yeah. I've been playing dance hall records since I started playing hip hop records. Wow. I mean, I remember listening to Supercat Don Data on repeat. <laughs> that album was in my boombox the same way Naughty by Nature or Tribe Called Quest was. Mm. You know, um, um, growing up in New York City in the 90s, listening to Funk Master Flex on Hot 97, you heard dancehall records every time he played. Wow. Um, but of course, reggae um, expands way beyond dancehall. Mm. Um, 
And I celebrate all areas of reggae music on this show. Wow. This show spans the longest amount of time that any show has spanned. There are records on this show spanning four decades. And wow. that is a first for Pass the Mic. Wow. I feature 21 individuals, 21 iconic individuals on this show, and I feature 16 iconic songs. That's the most number of songs that have ever been on a television episode, excluding the first three. Okay. Um, I wanted the pace to be rapid fire. You know, it's, it's, it's part of reggae culture and it's part um, of DJ culture to play reggae songs very fast, to, to yeah. keep them moving real fast. It's, it's very similar in hip hop, but even more so yeah. um, um, in reggae, particularly dancehall. And I wanted the show to feel like that. Uh -huh. And, you know, back in June, I had Sean Paul and Beanie Man and Wayne Wonder on the show. Yeah. And the reaction was over the top. People loved those three segments. They were really yeah. highlights, not only of the show, of the series. And that was like, that was the cherry on the cake. Yeah, okay. that was confirmation. I knew we had to do it. So... You know, I don't so much as see it as global and international as I do see it um, um, as mainstream popular music. Every song on this edition of Pass the Mic that airs on Saturday was a massive hit record. Okay. I think there's like half a dozen Billboard pop number ones on this show. Wow, wow. Uh, yeah. Not reggae charts, not hip-hop charts. Pop number ones. I think there's like half a dozen. You know, like you will be hard pressed to find a person that doesn't know every song on this show. I mean, th these songs are enormous. Yeah. So I mean, to me, yeah. it's just another theme to okay. celebrate. It's another era. But every song is just as iconic and prolific as every other song on every episode. I mean, and, um, we're definitely going to look forward to it. I mean, as I said, it, coming now living in the UK, so you know, um, and I'm and I know you're going to surprise us with guests, but people like Maxi Priest and Mr. Vegas and Shabba Ranks and you know, even members of the Mali family and you know, Supercat and all these people that you, um, that we all know in the U in the in the, in, the, in, in Nigeria and, and the UK because of the Commonwealth of Jamaica and, and, and the West Indies. But I know when I moved to the U.S., certain songs were big, but not as well known as, say, um, in here. So it'd be great to see that. It, and, and, and as you said, the fast pace would mean that before we can even celebrate one, we're going to be able to jump to the next one and, and really give the reggae its due promotion because it's really held it down for popular music for a long, long time and stuff. So this is going to be really great, for, especially for... Yeah, for reggae fans and, and black music fans. And, well, and I'm music so, fans. And, and I'm so happy you brought up Maxi Priest. Um, he was born in England, correct? Yeah. I think yeah. he was born in London. And so he represents unique things. You know, he represents a reggae artist who was born in England. Um, he's not the only one. Um, <laughs> obviously, we know that reggae music has a enormous following and stake in the culture uh, yeah. um, in the UK. Yeah. And Maxi also represents a fusion of reggae and R&B music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I really wanted to represent that on the show because, you know, Pass the Mic is all about fusion. It's all yeah. about connection. It's all about bridge building. Um, this show... I passed the mic to artists in four countries, which I also think is a first. It's, oh. it's the most number of countries we've we've passed the mic to, so to speak, on one show. Okay, because I know the last time in free, you took, apart from going to Hakeem in, in Syria, uh, I don't think you went outside the U.S. in free, but this would be interesting going to, to yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're not going to know which countries? You um, won't know in advance, although <laughs> okay. although we know England and Jamaica are two of them. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so, you know, I haven't told anyone yet, but um, I'm going to Jamaica to watch the show. We're having a viewing party in Kingston, and Whoa. it's going to be a fun weekend. So, so so the dead zone you've seen on Instagram is about to end. <laughs> okay. oh, goodness. You know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm Nigerian background, 
would you ever consider an Afrobeat one? Because it's now becoming a big, you know, you oh, got 100 percent. OK, 100 percent. You know, the sky's the limit. OK, the sky has always been the limit. So, you know, I've been asked many times, do you have enough ideas to keep going? And, you know, I said, there's there's many things I have in store for past the mic. But if I continue to do television shows in the format I have, there will be no shortage of ideas. That's okay. that's, that's for sure. And and <clears throat> the finally, just the because the, I saw the Pegasus, so uh, the event that you did. So yes, we, Pegasus World Cup. Pegasus World Cup. And so, are we going to expect to see Pastor Mike as a concert concept going more so? Because that in itself just felt like wow, that you know, it felt like wow, this could be great. Getting some of our favorite artists on a bill and torn the country. 100% yes. Um, for those listening who are unaware, I debuted Pass the Mic Live, a certain, a certain kind of tease, a prototype for the future to foreshadow what's to come. The Pegasus World Cup is like the Kentucky Derby. It's the biggest horse race of the year in America. It takes place annually in Miami. Um, thousands of people attend, and there's always a big concert at the end. Two years ago, Post Malone headlined wow. the year before Snoop Dogg, the year before Nelly. So this year, they um, called me and asked me if DJ Cassidy's Pass the Mic could, could be the main event. And I surprised guests with Ja Rule, Little Kim, Little Kim and Mace. Mace and and then Little Kim surprised us all with Jada Kiss and Little C's. <laughs> And then I brought out Elder Barge, who we've mentioned many times, and he closed the entire show with Rhythm of the Night. Yeah. And all the hip hop stars came on stage with him and it was magical. And the presentation of the show, the production of the show was exactly what I had always envisioned. It really was the real life manifestation of the television series. Are you busier now than you've ever been? I believe so. I believe every year of my career has grown. Mm. Um, but obviously the past year has grown tremendously. I never thought that I'd be the creator, producer, and star of a television show. I certainly would never have imagined <laughs> that a year and a half ago. And now I'm planning to take that on the road as well. So there's a lot of new, exciting things happening in addition to all the things I was known for doing before. So yes, it's a very, very busy and exciting time. And, you know, I'm really happy that we finally got to speak and I'm almost happy we didn't um, do this at the beginning. You know, I know you had reached out at the beginning and the schedules weren't aligned at first. I'm really happy we waited because you really are a student of the show. I can tell <laughs> you love the show. And I'm so grateful for that. And it's so nice and such an honor to speak to someone who really knows the ins and outs. Even the fact that you knew that I shot um, Hakeem from the boys in Africa <laughs> for volume three and the pajamas and, you know, every little detail, father MC and, you know, these details really, I don't want to say impress me, but they make me emotional that you, you know, that you're that aware of the ins and outs of the show. So I'm really happy we waited and we're going to have to do it again either before yeah. the June show or maybe after the June show to, to culminate the 10. Yeah, please do. Um, I, I, I can't end without saying something. I interviewed Gina Thompson uh, a couple of weeks ago and, you know, and she told us her, her emotional story <laughs> uh, about her, her record, uh, her albums being shelved. And then I said, how was it like doing past the mic? And to her, it almost felt like somebody had just picked her up from nowhere and just said, I'm going to make you shine despite all that has happened. And she said it was the most satisfying and rewarding thing that she had her kids watching her. And it's like, Oh, mommy actually was a star kind of thing. So just to say thank you on her behalf for, for, for what you did. And, 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 and it's given her that confidence that I'm going to go back out again. I'm going to try and re-resurrect my career which was, was sadly uh, curtailed. So it was the fact that you reached out to her is, is something that really has touched somebody like her and many of us. So I really appreciate things like that. Well, that, that really, uh, I don't even know what to say. That touches me 
in so many ways, um, again, to, to have some kind of effect on the artists who affected me. I remember playing Gina and Missy's record, The Things You Do, yeah. at some of my early parties in ninth and 10th grade. And that record rocked. You know, it was the first record that Missy Elliott ever rapped on. Yeah. E e e and it was a <laughs> remix produced by Puffy. Exactly. It was her famous E, -E yeah, E, -E yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I called, I called Mona Scott, who has managed Missy Elliott, I believe, mm -hmm. her whole career. And I asked Mona if she knew past the mic, and she did. <laughs> and I told her about the show that I was in the middle of producing. And I said, I want Missy on the show. And she told me right away that Missy was a fan of the show. Missy actually had posted volume two unsolicitedly. Wow. So I, so, so I knew Missy knew of the show. And then I said to Mona, okay, is you ready for my idea? <laughs> <laughs> you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. I don't want Missy to do I Can't Stand the Rain. She said, okay, you want her to do Work It? I said, no. <laughs> I said, that's a different era than this era. Missy spans many eras. I said, I want to do something really unexpected with Missy. I don't want her to do the song everyone would expect. Mm. I want her to do the first verse she ever did. I want her to do the things you do with Gina Thompson. <laughs> and Mona said, have you found Gina Thompson? <laughs> and I said, I haven't tried yet. And she said, well, if you can get a hold of Gina and she's down, then we're down. And I spent the next seven days putting out word that I was looking for Gina Thompson and Gina didn't have an Instagram. Yeah. And we also couldn't find her on Facebook. And it was bow legged Lou, a full force. <laughs> well, you both, yeah, the resources, talent scout. Who has been my partner in crime. He was my unofficial talent scout before <laughs> he became my official talent <laughs> scout, along with the legendary DJ Chillwill of Dougie Fresh's Get Fresh Crew. Mm -hmm. Chillwill and Bowlegged Lou really became my official co-talent coordinators. And I believe that Lou put out a message on his Facebook, is anyone in touch with Gina Thompson? And I got in touch with her and she was just the sweetest person. And yeah. I told her this idea and she said to me, have you reached out to Missy? You both <laughs> asked me the same question. Oh, goodness. And of course they both um, said yes. And that, that, that's, you know, um, um, I'd say if we speak again in June yeah. and you ask me for my top 10 moments, this will, sh you know, certainly be on my top 10 moments. Um, I later found out that Missy and Gina hadn't spoken really since they recorded the record. I mean, I think they might've like, they shot a video and they performed it a couple of times, but like they basically hadn't spoken since 1996. And after I told everyone that I had spoken to everyone, we were confirmed, I gave Gina's number to Missy. Yeah, Gina said so, yeah. <laughs> and I later found out that Missy called Gina and they yeah. spoke for like two hours on the yeah. phone. And and that just warmed my heart. So it's stories like you just told me that really are the fuse of my fire. You know, they are, they are what inspires me. These moments um, in which I feel like I might have inspired my heroes. Yeah. The, those are the greatest moments. So, and I'm so happy that you told me these stories, particularly that one. Yeah. Well, it, uh, you know, yeah. And the, 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 there'll be hundreds, but when you come, if we, when you do your 10th, yeah, fans of people who lost their families over the pandemic were, were posting how much watching, especially volume three, lifted them up from a, you know, one lady, one lady had her mom had just passed away. And then two days later, she was watching volume three and was able to say, as much as I miss my mom, 
watching this has really lifted my spirit and it, you know it was the most popular comment on on the, on the thread and so it has really touched a lot of people globally you know i've seen over 100 million people would have watched an episode and so um so we appreciate you um and as i said you know we will we, we will celebrate you on season or when you come out with season 10 and then probably hear about what's coming to what what we can expect as fans on a live show because that would a uh, live tour and and hopefully a behind the scenes because i know i saw a snippet of it a couple of months ago where you had you were telling big daddy kane okay you know you plug it in for the side so Hopefully we'll get a, a behind the scenes making of how you did one to three and, and stuff. Will we ever see something like that? A hundred percent. You know, right now I have like a 10 minute um, kind of sizzle reel that tells the journey and it tells it in quite an emotional way. But I think I'm going to wait until the summer okay. um, to, to put that out because I want the next two episodes to be a part of it. Okay. And then after the first 10 episodes, we'll see where we are and, I'm excited for everyone to see those moments because honestly, the behind the scenes moments are are even more emotional <laughs> than the moments you get to see. But before we go, you know, I want to thank you. You know, I've watched many of your shows. I have not watched all. I would like to catch up and see them all. Some of the moments that you've told me about on this show today, I've seen, um, um, but I haven't seen many um, of those and I would like to as well. Um, you've done an incredible thing. You know, you were also inspired to, to get in front of the camera and the microphone during the pandemic. And you've been interviewing so many R&B greats, some of which who have received the credit they deserve and many of which who have not received the credit they deserve. And you too have shined an incredible light on amazing musicians, some unsung some who have been heralded and some who have not. And you've done an incredible thing. And it's a testament to your show that so many artists have taken part. I know what it's like to call people and ask them to take part in something that's not on television and explain to them who I am and what I want them to do and why they should do it and who's done it. And those first 10 are always the hardest. And the fact that you're speaking to people like Elder Barge on this show is a testament to what you've created and it allows me to continue to do what I do because without platforms like yours that talk about it and, and that show highlights and review it, then what's my show? My show really is only as good as much as people watch it and talk about it afterwards and love it. And you give uh, um, you know, an incredible platform to R&B music in particular. So thank you for doing what you do. Ah, oh, Cassie, yeah, it, it's been, as I said, a great honor having you uh, today and i really appreciate what what you've said and i i interviewed father mc and timmy gatlin back and don robinson but only a handful of people were watching and when pastor mike three came out and we were able to i was able to put it on my channel overnight my channel went from i think 200 subscribers to almost ten thousand. And it was because wow. people were watching that. And all of a sudden I started to realize, well, let me start interviewing the people more featured on that. So <clears throat> my success has come from piggybacking off what you've created. So I will always be grateful for what you, you, you keep doing and, and things. And, and as I said, I appreciate even the fact that in your busy time, especially even today, you did, you did allocate time for me to, to hear your story and, and, and your journey. And, and I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much. It was great talking to you. And um, I can tell you're a therapist because you have a very soothing way about you and you're a very good listener. <laughs> and, you know, I do a lot of interviews and um, to, you know, to do one with someone who listens and reacts and who's informed and a fan of what you do is amazing. So I appreciate you. Let's make sure to do this again. Yeah either before the June show or maybe even after to talk about everything. Okay. okay. I, yeah, definitely. You know, I'll, I would wait. Uh, yeah. I will hit you up to say, okay, when, when's a good time. And as you, you generously gave me time today, I'll be, I'll be available and waiting. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate awesome. you. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe to the channel, but most importantly to press the notification bell.
so that you can be notified when we do have a new interview. Loads to come, but thanks a lot for watching.